This is criminal law revision for the topics of actus reus and mens rea. The study materials provided are revision pack, lecture notes, tutorial pack, and criminal projection, all of which can be downloaded from your Facebook group. Starting off firstly with the essay questions for actus reus and mens rea, I would advise you to prepare for two areas. Firstly, for actus reus, omission, and secondly, for mens rea, the compare and contrast type questions which have been in trend for the past seven years. Yes, looking at the revision pack, page 9. Essay questions on omission regularly appear in two types. Type 1, arguments for and against. Type 2, the descriptive answer. Note that one answer framework which you prepare cannot be used to answer all types of essay questions. You have to be careful. For type 1, arguments for and against, note that the key phrases in the questions are normally moral justifications, whether the current law is satisfactory to evaluate the law relating to omission and whether there should be a general duty when it comes to omission. So this type of question doesn't require you to state the general rule and exceptions for omission, but that you should focus on why there should or should not be omission liability. Now compare this with type 2, the descriptive answer. This is a type where you don't have to go into the arguments for or against but merely requiring you to state out the general rule and the exceptions. The other type of essay question which is worth preparing for is mens rea. On page 11, Judging by the frequency of appearance of such questions, it is worth preparing for the compare and contrast type of questions on mens rea. For example, 2019, 2014a, 2014b, inviting you to compare and contrast intention and recklessness. On the following page, 2017a and b, compare and contrast intention, recklessness and negligence. Going back to the actus reus, the three areas which you need to cover for exam are omission, causation and automatism. Looking at omission, a general overview, the general rule is no liability and for exam emphasis, the important exceptions are special relationship, contractual duty, voluntary assumption of responsibility, inadvertent creation of dangerous situation, and sometimes, together with inadvertent creation, Crown against Miller, you may need to rely on Crown against Evans Gamma, self-administration of dangerous drug as well, where it is not of the defendant himself creating the danger, but one of contributing to the danger. Then you may need to bring in Crown against Evans Gamma as well. And... Uh, Sometimes you may need to discuss whether the legal duty can be discharged crown against Stone and Dobinson, meaning that after having discussed the category of exception which can apply, you may need to discuss based on what has been done by the defendant. Not that the defendant didn't do anything at all, but that based on what the defendant has done, harm was not prevented. Then can it be argued that the defendant had satisfactorily discharged his legal duty? Looking now at the lecture notes, page 5. Four point three. General rule is that there is no liability for omission. Categories of exceptions which are important for exam. 4.42, special relationship, parent-child relationship, crown against Gibbons and Proctor, spousal relationship, crown against Bonniman. At this point, I wish to point out that for 4.41, Section 1, Children and Young Persons Act 1933, note that this act does not apply to any child victim because this act applies only to a parent-child relationship relationship, not just to any child victim. Next page. 
contractual duty to act, crown against Pitewood, voluntary assumption of responsibility, crown against Instant, crown against Stone and Dobinson. For Instant, note that the duty was imposed not on the basis of the aunt niece relationship, the same with Stone and Dobinson, not on the basis of sibling relationship. A parent does have legal obligation to look after the child. But when it comes to between siblings, there is no such legal duty. And that aunt and niece in uh, Crown Against Instant, no such legal duty imposed as well. 4.45, inadvertent creation of a dangerous situation, Crown Against Miller. 4.46, self-administration of dangerous drugs supplied by the defendant. Now, the case of Crown against Evans Gamma, some view this case law as a variation of Crown against Miller. In Crown against Miller, the defendant had a duty to act because the defendant created the danger. However, in Evans Gamma, the defendant had a duty to act even though the defendant had merely contributed to the danger. So, in your exam scenario, when you find the defendant not being solely responsible for danger, but had merely contributed to the creation of danger, then you can apply Crown against Evans Gamma as well. 4.5. If the defendant has a legal duty to act, he can be discharged by acting to a reasonable standard Crown against Stone and Dobinson. Uh, this you have to discuss where it is not a complete omission, but that the defendant has acted, but that the defendant's conduct was not adequate in preventing harm to the victim. Then you need to discuss discharging of duty. Next, looking at causation. An overview on causation. There are two limbs of causation, factual and legal. Both must be satisfied in order for there to be causation. For factual causation, you apply the but-for test in Crown against White. For legal causation, there are two issues to discuss. Substantial cause as well as the chain of causation must not have been broken by any novel actors' intervenience. So that is why you need to look at NAI. For exam emphasis, look at third-party intervention, Crown against Padgett, Escape Case, Roberts, Excel Scout Rule, Crown against Blau, Medical Intervention, the Victim's Conduct, and the Victim's Act of Suicide. Looking at Lecture Notes, page 7. Causation, important would be 5.3. Factual causation, the but for test in Crown against White. 5.4, legal causation, the two issues which you must establish for legal causation. Substantial cause, Paget, the defendant did not have been the sole cause or even the main cause. 5.42, the chain of causation must not have been broken by any NAI. NAI cases important for exam 6.2, third party intervention, Crown against Paget. Do note the obiter in Crown against Paget that a free, voluntary, and informed intervention could break the chain of causation. 6.3, escape case, Crown against Roberts. 6.4, Ixchel Scar rule. Take your victim as you find your victim. This is also where you find a case law on the refusal of medical treatment. The case being Crown against Blau. And note that Crown against Blau is a controversial case. So do note the commentaries and see which of the commentaries here can be applied to your answer. Blau is difficult to be reconciled with Crown against Roberts. Why? Because Roberts focuses on foreseeability. However, Blau had nothing to do with reasonable foreseeability. Blau was a controversial decision. The courts would be more accommodating to the sensitivities of religious reasons. In your exam, you have to be careful. Look at the reason for refusal of medical treatment. If the reason for refusal is a religious one, then you can easily apply Blau. 
but if the reason for refusing treatment was non-religious, then you may want to distinguish it from the precedent in blood. 6.5, medical intervention. You have wrongful medical treatment or inefficient medical service. Note that this can apply to doctors as well as nurses and any other medical workers like paramedics. Palpably wrongful treatment or service, crowned against Jordan, and operating costs, crowned against Smith and crowned against Cheshire. You can apply both to your exam scenario. The next page, 6.53, inappropriate medical environment or death due to infection, such as septicemia. In your exam scenario, apply the case law in Crown Against Governance. Switching off life support machine, Crown Against Melcher and Steel. 6.6, .6, supervening conduct of the victim. Popular in recent years is the victim's own suicide act. For many years, the cases applicable would be Crown Against Deer and Crown Against Dhaliwal. However, when it comes to the Victim Suicidal Act, today we have the relatively recent case, 2018, Crown Against Wallace. Notwithstanding the time gap of two years between the Defendant's Act and the Act of Suicide, the causal link could still be established, as pointed out in Crown Against Wallace, because of Crown against Wallace being a recent case law, it, it has been popular in your exam. So be prepared for Victims Suicidal Act. And uh, as for automatism, kindly refer to my video recording on general defences. Looking now at the module guide activities for omission, revision pack, page 16. Next, we shall look at the module guide activities for Arcturus omission. The reason is this. As pointed out by the examiners in the examiner's report here, if you now go through the examination paper below with your module guide open, you will see that everything you need to answer the questions is there. The examiners have pointed out the importance of you studying the module guide activities. Why? Because the scenarios in the module guide activities may well appear in your exam. Look at omission module guide activities. Some excerpts. A. A is a swimming pool attendant. Here you're looking at swimming pool attendants or lifeguard and that you should be considering, among others, contractual duty to act when it comes to omission. For B, C and D, note that for C, A is the mother of the victim. There can be a legal duty imposed on the basis of special relationship, parent-child relationship. You compare C with B and D. For B and D, you find that legal duty cannot be imposed. B. A is a sister of the victim and D. A is a son of the victim. From this you can see that the victim's sibling or the victim's child does not owe a legal duty to the victim. E. Uh, reading E, the answer is not clear. Although A has a contract with the victim, does this contract involve a duty of care? So the answer for this depends on the contents of the contract made between A and the victim. So you need to find as to whether there is any 
a contractual obligation to save the victim's life or to prevent the victims uh, from, from suffer suffering harm. Now F, for F you find that the legal duty is imposed on the basis of A as an adult inviting the victim as a child over to swim. For G, A and V are an unmarried couple who live together. Note that unmarried couple meaning that the parties did not have a spousal relationship and thereby the law in Crown against Bonniman does not apply because the Bonniman applies only to husband and wife relationship. Next page. H. It is on creation of dangerous situation, Crown against Miller. Continuing with the tutorial pack, page 6, looking at past year questions for omission and causation. In the tutorial pack, you will find all the answer guides for the various past year questions. What I wish to find, uh, point out for the answer guide is for omission, you need to firstly identify the offence before discussing omission. Because omission on its own is not a crime. It is merely a principle for establishing actus reus. Thus, Note that okay, you have to always discuss omission within the context of an offence. So you see here in the answer guide, apart from the discussion of the legal duty for omission, Crown against Miller, I also have to identify the offences such as CM, GNM and RM for this question. For 2014 BQ2, you find the various duties being imposed in the advertent creation of dangerous situation, contractual duty, voluntary assumption of responsibility. But what I want you to see is that in point 3 and 4, for Mona and for Ellie, I've also discussed discharging of the legal duty imposed, meaning that sometimes the exam scenario would require you to discuss after identifying the exception category, thereafter, you have to discuss additionally as to whether the legal duty imposed could have been discharged by the defendant's conduct. Page 7. Page 7, 2012 AQ4, you find that in the discussion on Lina's legal duty to act, more than one category of exception can apply. So in your exam, it's not just to identify one exception for one scenario. It can be multiple exceptions. So long as they are relevant, you can discuss them. 2007 BQ5, the question of Robin, you find that for the lifeguard, you discuss contractual duty to act on the basis of employment contract as a lifeguard. Next, for causation. Exam pointer here for causation. Do not always discuss causation. You have to be careful in your exam. Only if there is either a complication in the causal link, such as a supervening event or third-party conduct coming in between the defendant and the victim, or that there is a problem with but-for test, factual causation, should you discuss causation. You do not always discuss causation, especially where you can read from the exam scenario that it is a straightforward scenario of the defendant 
stabbing the victim and the victim died instantly. Nothing came in between them. Then do not discuss causation. 2016 AQ1, question of Hashim and Alistair. Note that in the answer framework, you have to discuss both factual causation and legal causation. So both factual and legal must be established. It is not either one. On page 8, tutorial pack. This is the answer framework for medical intervention. Note that you can discuss both Crown Against Jordan, Palpably Wrong and Cheshire Smith for operating course. Looking at page 10. Page 10, 2010 BQ1A, Harry's mother. Uh, this is a rare type of question for causation. This question, you find that you only have to discuss factual causation but for tests and that there is no requirement for you to discuss Norwood's actors' intervenience. So normally for most questions, you have to discuss NAI. This is the rare question wherein you don't have to discuss NAI. It is only factual causation. Page 11. Page 11, 2007BQ5, question of Pinto. A question of Pinto is on suicidal scenario, where you find the victim committing suicide after the defendant having inflicted harm on the victim. For suicidal case, formerly candidates could only discuss crown against deer and crown against daliba. Now note that today, with the case of Volus, 2018. Applying Volus 2018, you have a lot more to discuss. Read the answer framework. On page 13, you find the answer guide for automatism. I won't run through automatism in detail because you can refer to my video recording on general defences and automatism is covered therein as one of the general defences. At this point, we are done with Arctus Rias. Moving on next to Menstria. For Menstria, this is what you need to cover. The three common types of Menstria, intention, recklessness and negligence. And the relationship between actus reus and menstrua, coincidence between actus reus menstrua and the doctrine of transferred malice. For intention, note that intention is not the same as motive, and that there are two types of intention, direct and oblique. For di direct intention, it is where you find it apparent from the facts. You know that it is the immediate purpose or desire of the defendant to bring about a particular consequence. As for oblique intention, where you find that it is not the purpose or desire of the defendant to bring about the consequence, you can apply the VC test, the virtual certainty test found in Vulin. Looking at intention, lecture notes, page 10. Exam emphasis important to be 2.1 on page 10. Intention, you have to distinguish it from motive. They're not the same. Chandler against DPP. From the same case, you also need to know that good motive cannot prevent the finding or formation of intention. So good motive for murder does not prevent murder if the killing comes with it intention to kill, for example. For direct intention, it is where it is a defendant's purpose or desire, where in your exam it is normally obvious, where it is 
explicitly stated in the question. For example, you're told the defendant intending to kill the victim stabs the victim. Next page, page 11. Oblique intention. The test is the virtual certainty test. And the current law applicable is that in Crown against Bullion. Now, for the virtual certainty test, you should not discuss oblique intention if direct intention can be established. What it means is that where it is explicitly stated the intention of the defendant in the exam scenario, you must not discuss oblique intention because that will irk the examiners, as pointed out in the examiner's report multiple times. On page 12, on recklessness, page 12, recklessness. For recklessness, note that there are two types, subjective and objective. Subjective recklessness, this is the current law, crown against you and another. And objective recklessness for the purposes of problem question in your exam, you don't have to discuss. Recklessness, 3.5, the current law is crowned against you in another subjective Cunningham recklessness. Page 13. Page 13, crowned against you in another, the defendant must have foreseen the risk. Under this test, if the defendant generally failed to appreciate the risk because of his young age, intelligence or some other characteristic, he should not be found guilty. So applying subjective recklessness in your exam, you have to take into account the defendant's weaknesses such as young age or low IQ commonly in your exam and that on taking into account such weaknesses, the defendant might not be able to foresee the existence of risk. And for that reason, he may not be reckless. 3.7, intentional recklessness, intoxication and recklessness. This has been popular in recent years where you find that the defendant has voluntarily gotten himself drunk and then he recklessly committed, as in accidentally, not deliberately uh, committing crime then you need to run through the case law in Crown against Bennett. The defendant will not be able to claim that he failed to foresee an obvious risk because he was drunk. So what it means is that it will be no excuse for a person to tell the court that he could not have foreseen the risk because he was voluntarily drunk. No. Assessing or judging him by the standard of a sober person, the defendant, may still be found liable, notwithstanding his state of drunkenness. As for negligence, you only need to focus on negligence within the context of gross negligence manslaughter because in the exam, this is the only area which you need to discuss negligence. Relationship between actus reus and menstrual. Looking firstly at coincidence of actus reus and menstrual, there must be a coincidence of actus reus and menstrual at least for a split second. Looking at the visuals, for the first diagram, you see that the timeline of actus reus and menstrual, the first diagram is where coincidence cannot be established. Why? Because over here, in the middle, you find that there is no coincidence, there is no accompaniment of actus reus and menstrual. So, having established actus reus and menstrual respect, respectively may not be good enough for liability. You need to establish coincidence between the two. A diagram 2, you find that actus reus and menstrual, they accompany each other throughout. Uh, this is good enough. However, the law doesn't say that there must be accompaniment of actus reus and menstrual throughout the commission of the crime. The next diagram, the third one, you find 
coincidence for a shorter period of time, this is good enough for liability as well. Now, even for the last one, you find that the coincidence is only for a split second in the middle. Is it good enough for liability? The answer is yes. And this is based on the case of Tabo Mali. In Tabo Mali against the Queen, both the earlier and the later acts constituted one series of acts which should not be technically divided in order to avoid coincidence. So in your exam scenario, if you find that okay, the course of events, the first part was one wherein there was menstrual for the crime, and in the second part there was no menstrual, then you can apply Tabo Mali. And commonly in your exam in recent years, you find that the examiners may also require you to discuss Crown against Lebrun, wherein the defendant's act of tidying up, hiding the victim's body, was to serve the defendant's interests, Okay, not the victims, and the outcome might have been different had the defendants picked the victim up in order to bring her to a doctor. This is where the law in Crown against Lebrun okay, we require you to look at the reason for the defendant's subsequent conduct which accidentally killed the victim. If the defendant's subsequent conduct was in good faith, for example, to help the victim, such as to send the victim to the hospital, then the defendant should not be liable. But if it was in bad faith, for example, to hide the victim's body in order to evade criminal action, then the defendant should still be liable. Continuing with lecture notes, page 14. Doctrine of Transferred Malice You need to consider the Doctrine of Transferred Malice normally in a type of exam scenario where there is a missing of target. For example, the defendant aimed to shoot at the victim but he accidentally shot a third party. Or that the defendant attempted to hit car A with a brick but that he missed the target and hit car B instead. Consider the Doctrine of Transferred Malice where if the defendant has menstrual for one offence, it can be transferred to another offence of the same type, crowned against Latimer. Note, offence of the same type. Looking at the visual here, Doctrine of Transferred Malice. The first visual, the defendant had his menstrual directed at A, but when he attacked, he accidentally attacked B, missing the target. So here is where the doctrine can apply. The man's rear directed at A can be transferred to B. The same with this. The defendant directed his man's rear at car A, but that he missed car A and hit car B instead. So actus rear was in respect of car, uh, car B. So the man's rear directed at A can be transferred to B. The visual below is one where the doctrine of transfer malice cannot apply. You find that okay, it is not an offence of the same type. The men's rear was directed at the car, but the actor's rear was in respect of a person. So the men's rear directed at a property type offence cannot be transferred to a personal injury type of offence. This is a principle in Crown against Pambleton. 2.4. Transferring malice from mother to a fetus or the baby. Uh, this has not been popular over the years but nonetheless it appeared once in recent years. The law is that found in Aegis reference number 3 of 1994 where there was an intention to kill the mother, but no intention to kill the baby. However, the mother eventually was not killed, but that the baby was killed. Note that murder requires the killing of a human being. And killing a fetus is not murder, because fetus is not a human being. So the legal issue is whether the intention to kill the mother can be transferred to the baby who eventually died. 
The answer is found in AG's reference number one, number three of 1994. You find that this would require a double transfer of malice from the mother to the fetus and thereafter from the fetus to the baby. And it was held in this case that a double transfer of malice was not allowed and thereby there was no murder of the baby. An alternative conviction or alternative murder uh, 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 offence for conviction here could be constructive manslaughter. For mens rea, I wish to explain further on the degree of foresight. Note that for oblique intention and recklessness, both types of mens rea require consideration of foresight. But be very careful in the sense that the foresight, the degree of foresight for oblique intention is very different from recklessness and sometimes candidates confuse foresight of high risk with one of foresight of virtual certainty. You can see that if it is one of a possibility probability, a likelihood or a chance of a consequence occurring, such a foresight is recklessness. But what about a high probability, high risk or high chance, such as 80%, 90% over percent chance of something happening? Would it be one warranting foresight of virtual certainty? The answer is no. Foresight of high risk is different from foresight of virtual certainty. Foresight of virtual certainty is one of virtually certain, almost like certain, where you cause an explosion to the plane flying in mid-air, it is a matter of virtual certainty that the people would either die or suffer serious harm. It won't be one wherein miraculously people would survive under normal circumstances, as in barring some unforeseen intervention. So it is not a matter of high risk. So when it comes to high risk being foreseeable, it is only adequate to establish recklessness. It's not good enough for oblique intention. So whether it is low risk or even high risk, it is still one of recklessness. It is not one of virtual certainty. Note the different degree of foresight. Next, looking at module guide activities for omission, revision pack page 17. For A, Adam's wife Eve is trapped in a car. For this question, you read that the purpose of the defendant was to kill the victim, albeit out of good motive. Thus, there would have been direct intention to kill. And also note from this question that good motive cannot prevent the finding of mens rea. Scenario B. Adam and Eve go climbing together in the mountains. For this scenario, you find that it was not the purpose of the defendant to kill the victim, meaning that there was no direct intention. So in a question like this, you have to discuss oblique intention, virtual certainty test. Scenario C, Adam, an angry farmer. In this scenario, you find that Adam is angry and he aims his gun at her and shoots. For this, you find that there is direct intention, notwithstanding the fact that Adam could have been provoked. We are told that he was angry and thereby he fired the shot. So what you learn from this is notwithstanding provocation, direct intention can still be established. Next, looking at coincidence of actus res and mens rea. You have this scenario, the requirements of coincidence. At the bottom, doctrine of transferred malice. Scenario B, A fires a gun at B who is in a car.
For this, you find that recklessness can be transferred by way of doctrine of transferred malice. From this, you learn that doctrine of transferred malice can be used to transfer not only intention, the doctrine of transferred malice can be used to transfer recklessness as well. Next, looking at the past year questions for omission and causation, tutorial pack, page 14. Looking at question two, John went out shooting with Fred. Note that we are told by the facts of the scenario, there was a million to one chance that he would do so. And that if there was a direct intention to kill, the statistical uh, probability would be of lesser importance. What you can see from this is that if in the exam scenario you are told that there was an intention, a desire to kill, being a direct intention to kill, you can okay, uh, uh, disregard, okay, you can disregard okay, the fact that in terms of the statistical possibility of it happening would be uh, 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 very low. So if you are told of direct intention, there is no reason for you to discuss foresight of virtual certainty. Question five. It is the same here. If there was a direct intention to kill, then the statistical possibility or effectiveness of method of killing would be of lesser importance. How do we know that there was direct intention to kill? Here, we are told that he hopes that it will kill her, giving us the direct intention. Page 15. Question 6. 2012 BQ7 Graham suffers from delusions. In this question, the answer guide, you can learn that even if the defendant was suffering from a certain mental illness, the defendant can still form intention. The conduct can still be intentional. So it can't be where you submit, if the defendant was suffering from a mental illness, he could not have had any intention or recklessness. Okay, that would be incorrect. A person suffering from mental illness can still form mens rea. Question 7. Question of Ian. In the question of Ian, you find that intention cannot be established. Recklessness cannot be established as well. So sometimes it can be like that. Why? Because it's a situation of automatism. So both intention and recklessness cannot be established. Question 9. Question 9. Take note that you are explicitly told in the question, question 9 and question 10, intending to cause Pete serious harm. Question 10. Intending to cause him serious harm. Now, these are examples of questions wherein you are explicitly told of the intention to cause serious harm, warranting uh, a charge of murder. So this is where you must not discuss oblique intention for murder, because direct intention for murder can definitely be established. On page 16, tutorial pack, question 13, the same. Intending serious harm. Over the years, there have been many questions on this okay, where you have uh, the examiners pointed out in their report that if the intention is explicitly stated, the examiners do not want the candidates to discuss oblique intention. 
So do not irk the examiners with such answers discussing oblique intention. So here, do not discuss oblique intention. Point number 16 on the examiner's report. On the issue of menstrual, although some students did limit their discussion to, for example, menstrual for murderous intention, intention to what? Students were also generally weak on the issue of recklessness. It is not enough to say recklessness is sufficient. Sufficient what? So the point here is examiners do not want you to simply write in your answer that the defendant had the intention or that the defendant had the recklessness, full stop. You must further explain why there was intention or recklessness. For example, if you submit that the defendant uh, could have been reckless, then you apply the law on recklessness, which is crown against G and another, or crown against Cunningham, on subjective recklessness, foresight of risk of the consequence, but nonetheless proceeded to take the risk. Page 17, point number 18. In the question of Angus, if you can read that a certain conduct of the defendant was deliberate, then it is likely that the conduct would have been intentional. So this is one of the ways where you know whether intention can be established. Page 18, question 23. Again, you're told, intending to cause him serious harm in this question of Mitch. Okay. The intention is expressly stated, so you must not discuss oblique intention. On page 19, question 27. It's a question on coincidence of actress and menstrual. This is where you discuss Tabo Mali against the Queen together with Crown against Lebrun, where the court will look at the reason for the subsequent conduct as well. So you have to look as to whether it was in done, it was done in good faith or bad faith when it comes to Crown against Lebrun. Question 28. You read that. Adam was provoked by Eve. This is another question which illustrates that even if the defendant could have been provoked or that the action was compulsive, nonetheless, if the action was goal directed, intention can still be established. And lastly, on page 20, question 26. This is another question on coincidence discussing Tabo Mali against Queen and also requiring a discussion of the reason for the defendant's subsequent conduct by way of Crown against the Brum. End of recording.